Hi everyone, I'm Linda Grant. I'm with the City of Palo Alto. Excited to host this class today. I'm gonna go over a couple introductions and then we'll get to the main instructor. I know we've all been on, on Zoom a lot recently, but just a couple information of how we're gonna go about this. You can put your question into the Q&A box and we will ask Suzanne, those questions at the end. You can also raise your hand at the end of the webinar and we can unmute you so you can ask our instructor your question directly. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Bosco website. So a little bit of background about Bosco. Bosco represents 26 agencies, include Cities, water districts, a water company, and a university, all that purchase water from the San Francisco system. Bosca member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses. Bosca's goal is high quality supply of water at a fair price. Outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosca service area by doing water efficient planting, rainwater capture and efficient irrigation, we can conserve water and ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. If you live here in Palo Alto, we partner with Valley Water on several rebates and programs. So we have a lawn conversion rebate where you can get a rebate of up to $4 per square foot for converting your grass to drought tolerant plants. In addition, we have several stormwater rebates, including rain barrels, cisterns, rain gardens, and a laundry to landscape rebate as well. All the information on our rebates can be found at cityofpaloalto.org slash ways to save. In addition, here in Palo Alto, we recently launched WaterSmart. This is an online portal where you can log in and see your monthly water use. Um, you'll get personalized recommendations on ways that you can save water. It'll link directly to our rebates and other resources. You might be getting monthly see an email from WaterSmart with your home water report showing how you're doing compared to similar customers in the area. This is a great new resource to help you better understand your water use. In addition, you can get free mulch from Hopkins Tennis Court and Mitchell Park. And the compost giveaway station is at Eleanor Party Community Garden. So you'll be learning a little bit about the, the importance of, of mulch and compost. Now, if you don't live in Palo Alto, but you are with a Bosca agency, Bosca has similar rebate programs. So there's the Lawn Be Gone rebate program where you can get $1 to $4 per square foot for replacing your lawn with drought tolerant plants. They have a rain barrel rebate as well. Um, there's a smart controller rebate program and a rain garden rebate through Bosca. So to find out what rebates your agency participates in, go to bayareaconservation.org and you should be able to click on your city and see what offerings there are. Um, Valley Water also has several videos and guides available. There's also the southbaygreengardens.org that has planting guides and resources. And join us at upcoming workshops. So on September 30th, we're gonna be holding an in-person rain barrel rock workshop at Rinconada Library. Please, please come up for that. Excited to, to see everyone in person. And then um, we also have a workshop at the end of on at the end of October that I, I don't see on this list yet because of um I guess just how far this goes, but please please join us on October 28th for an in-person workshop where you'll learn about succulents and how to care for them. Participants will also create a succulent container garden to go home. So all of that information will be in a follow-up email that we send. Um, but please, please join us for, for these upcoming classes. For more information, um, you can go to waterwise or bayareagardening.org 
more, more resources about plantings and best practices. And then now I'm going to introduce our instructor. So Suzanne Von Tempo works as an environmental educator teaching the principles of integrated pest management for sustainable, eco-friendly pest management around the home and garden. Suzanne is an owner of Plant Harmony and the IPM Advocate Program Coordinator for Our Water, Our World. She was recognized for excellence in our field, winning the 2013 IPM Innovators Award. She has worked as a professional gardener for over 25 years, um, several qualifications, Quell, Rescape, um, a master composter, and more. She, she loves teaching folks about how to grow beautiful gardens that are safe and healthy for you. Suzanne, take it away. Thank you. I am so excited that um, you all are joining us tonight to talk about one of my favorite topics, integrated pest management. It is uh, not very zhuzhy. In fact, I am impressed that um, so many people registered and are attending tonight. So let's get started. Um, oh yes, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all and share. Uh, there's so much to share, but I'm really gonna try to keep it um, as minimum as possible, but we're still going to dive in for a solid hour. Okay. So I always pack in a lot to my programs. If you've joined me before, you know, you get a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak. And what I'm going to review tonight or what, what you're going to learn is uh, first, I'm just going to talk about what is a pest. And then I'm going to share the principles of integrated pest management or IPM. And then we're going to dive into those IPM techniques. So you have an idea of what they are what it looks like. Then I'm going to share a few words about identifying pests and then provide uh, some examples of managing the pests picked out for us. So um, that will be at the end. All right. So, what is a pest? So, according to the University of California, a pest can be a plant or a vertebrate or uh, you know, a plant like a weed, a vertebrate, bird, rodent, uh, or other mammal. Um, invertebrate, which would be insects, ticks, mites, snails. Uh, nematodes can be, um, there could be pest nematodes as well as beneficial ones, but pest nematodes, uh, pathogens such as uh, those diseases like bacteria or viruses or funguses. Um, and pretty much any unwanted organism that may harm water quality, animal life, or parts of an ecosystem, such as our home and or our garden. So I like to think of a pest as a living organism that causes damage that is undesirable. Then there's abiotic factors. So um, these are uh, caused by physical conditions. So it's not a pest, but oftentimes it looks like it could, like the damage that happens to a plant or a structure could look like a pest when really it's a abiotic factor, which is a physical condition and a non-living component that is causing that problem. So some examples that we are recently seeing, and the reason why I'm adding this to uh, my uh, program tonight is fire damage, um, water, too much water or not enough. And when we had those excessive rains over this past winter, we really saw a lot of abiotic factors showing up in the form of like mushrooms or other fungal problems that were causing uh, stressed trees to uh, show more signs of decline. Wind, wind is a big factor here. Again, um, seeing lots of uh, branches from trees and larger shrubs getting blown out. Uh, heat, excessive heat or sun scald, sunburn. These also uh, are problems. Humidity is another problem and cold, frost or hail is a problem when it comes to our plants. It can really do a lot of damage out there. But other components that we might not have ever considered would be nutrient deficiencies, like over fertilizing with too much nitrogen fertilizer or uh, going too heavy with the synthetic fertilizers, uh, pH related issues, excessive soil salinity, especially for those of us that live along the coast, this is an issue. 
Uh, improper use of pesticides can be a problem and show signs that might look like a pest when it's really just, we didn't use the pesticide correctly compacted soil, and then pollution, both in the air and water. So these are just things I would just like to throw out there so you can consider. So let's talk about integrated pest management or IPM. So integrated pest management is a decision-making process that allows us to look at the system as a whole, and we use science-based strategies. So what that means is that when we see a problem, we want to understand why is that problem happening? Uh, what is really going on? So um, we might have, um, my example I had was, oh, I have a, um, a hedgerow of lavender. I just love lavender. And it's along the border of my garden. And all of a sudden, they started to wilt or maybe kind of have tip die back. So I might think, oh gosh, there must be a disease or something wrong with the soil. So I'm gonna to go to the garden center and I'm gonna ask, I've got some diseases, I need a fungicide. And so then I come home and I spray that fungicide on it. But really what the problem was is that those lavender plants were getting too much water. So the problem really was irrigation. It was being, they are being improperly irrigated. So then the next question we have when we see a pest problem, let's just say aphids, aphids on my roses. Well, is this something that we can live with? Well, personally, I get really excited when I see aphids in the spring uh, start to show up on my roses because that means beneficial insects are coming uh, right around the corner. So that is very exciting for me. So that's just a little bit of the story of integrated pest management, what it looks like, but integrated pest management um, relies on proper identification of the pest, then uh, we're always looking at how we can prevent pest problems from happening. And then if we need to take action, the action steps in IPM are referred to as controls. So cultural controls are bolstering the health of the environment, such as the home or the garden, increasing that health and making sure it is gonna be really resilient in case some pest problems do show up. Uh, it won't have a big impact. Uh, mechanical controls or physical controls are the tools we use to manage the pest problems. Um, biological controls are inviting uh, living organisms such as beneficial insects um, to support that ecosystem and help keep a balance. And then the chemical controls are always used as a last resort when we've exercised all of the other controls. Uh, we're of course always going to use uh, eco-friendlies. So whenever I refer to pesticides in my program tonight, I'm always referring to something that's eco-friendly. Um, but what I can also share is one of my teachers years ago, she doesn't um, consider chemical controls at all. She absolutely doesn't use pesticides, even eco-friendlies. So what her uh, replacement control is, a shovel control. She gives herself permission to physically dig up that plant and remove it if it's a plant that's not doing well, if it has never uh, thrived the way we expected. So I just like to throw that in there. Um, you know, if give yourself some permission to remove plants that don't work for you or just have a, uh, that are constantly uh, showing signs of stress and pest problems. All right. So this is kind of the graph. So when um, an IPM, when we're practicing integrated pest management in our gardens or in our homes, uh, we're all, this is a constant circle. So we're always inspecting and I, then we're going to identify and then we're going to evaluate the threshold. Is, do we need to take action? Um, then what action do we take? And then we're going to monitor and we're going to inspect. So it's kind of an ever evolving process that never stops. This is a uh, illustration of what that looks like. Um, I just think this is wonderful, especially right now since it's apple season. Um, I think this, uh, many of us can relate to this, but here is a great illustration of that same practice of inspecting or uh, monitoring, um, then identifying what is going on, what the problem is, evaluating the threshold of tolerance. And I will share something about thresholds of tolerance. Um, the plants have a much, a uh, larger, uh, bigger threshold of tolerance than us. Oftentimes we are the fussy ones or we're the ones that just need to like um, 
oh my gosh, we can't have any pests here. I need to run to the store and get something to spray on it and kill it. So um, I just think that's really funny um, that the plants are actually much more resilient, especially if we practice integrated pest management which I'll dive more into in a moment. But here we go then with uh, the evaluation and then we're gonna take action and monitor and so forth. So um, that's just an illustration of what I'm talking about. All right, so let's dive into IPM techniques. So integrated pest management is, um, let's start with cultural control. So we wanna increase the health of the environment. So in the home, what this looks like is sealing up cracks and crevices to prevent crawling insects from coming in, fixing leaky pipes that might attract uh, pests. Uh, we're going to pest uh, proof food containers. We're gonna yeah, put food in the pest proof containers. We are going to um, make sure the foundation, the perimeter of the foundation is clear of debris or plant material. We're gonna move remove any plant material that might be up against a structure because when we have uh, debris or plant material up against a house, for instance, it's just a little a runway or an invitation for, um, for pests to come into the home. And then out in the garden, we're going to look at building um, healthy soils and so that the plant root zones can really grow to their optimum health. We're going to feed with organic fertilizers. We're going to protect those uh, that soil with mulch. We're going to plant the right plant in the right place always. We're going to rotate annual food crops to increase the health of those plants and increase those yields. We're going to water deeply and less often as plants grow and become established. And we're gonna provide healthy garden maintenance. So let's look at garden first, since this is a little bit more involved. Um, so building healthy soil. It is really important whenever we're adding plants to our garden to amend that soil with compost at time of planting. If we have an established garden, it's really nice to seasonally, and I say that usually it's around the fall, October-ish, and then the spring, March-ish, that I will add a nice inch or two of compost around the um, root zones of my plants, especially my fruit trees and any of my food gardens. Um, I will also add this to my roses or any other flowering plants that really like a lot of food. This is going to just get that microbiology into the soil, which then is going to further enhance and support the root zones to make those plants more resilient. When we have compost in the soil, we're able to increase the water retention in that soil so that we don't have to water as often. Um, when we're adding compost to the soil, we're reducing pest problems because the plants are less stressed. So as a result, we are reducing the need to use pesticides. Amazing. And um, yes, uh, when we add compost, uh, especially earthworm castings to the soil, there are uh, enzymes and chitins in the earthworm castings and other uh, very good quality compost that move through the vascular system of the plant and make them uh, more resilient to uh, diseases uh, and then bad bacteria in the soil and other pathogens that might be around. It's amazing. We are going to uh, feed and uh, nurture the soil with organic fertilizers. It's the most sustainable way to feed our plants. We're actually feeding the soil microbiology that we just added with all that compost. And so when we feed with organics, we're increasing the health of the soil. It's actually less expensive to feed with organic fertilizers than synthetic fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers, it is um, required that you are feeding in accordance to what the label says of that bag or that box, because if you miss a feeding, then that plant is essentially starving um, and then it will become stressed. But when we're feeding with organics, those plants, that root zone is able to take up those nutrients on an as-need basis. It's also going to prevent growth spurts, unlike synthetic fertilizers that act a little bit like steroids uh, and swell the cells of those plants with sugary juices. That attracts pests. When we feed with organics, 
Uh, that doesn't happen. The plants can grow more naturally and we see less pests uh, attacking those plants. And then of course, uh, you cannot overburn or over fertilize with organics. So there's no need to worry. And any of that runoff will not uh, pollute waterways or aqueducts or our groundwater. So it's a much safer and more sustainable way to feed plants. Then we're going to take advantage of all the benefits mulch has to offer. Of course, we're going to uh, apply mulch in accordance to what CAL FIRE recommendations are, uh, applying it beyond zone one. But understand, um, this is really uh, interesting. Soil that does not have mulch on top. And when I'm talking about mulch here, I'm talking about organic material like uh, wood chips or wood bark or anything that went through a wood chipper or straw, anything like that. I'm not talking about rubber mulch or gravel. Um, uh, gravel would be appropriate for the first zone, uh, the first five feet around your house uh, because it's um, non compostable But out in the garden beds, I really, uh, I'm talking about a wood uh, or some type of an organic material like wood chips. Soil that doesn't have any mulch on top um, creates a crust, so to speak. And if it, we were to get rain or if we were to water that soil, uh, that water would actually just bead right off. Um, but when we have a nice two to three inch layer of mulch on top of that soil, it prevents that crust. It allows that water to actually absorb into the soil with ease. So that is really one of the main reasons we want to use mulch. Another important reason is when we've got that two to three inches of mulch on top of the soil, it's reducing water evaporation. So we don't have to water as frequently. It's really protecting those root zones, regulating the soil temperatures, keeping those soil temperatures cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And um, boy, I will share, when we have mulch protecting our root zones of our plants, a nice layer on top of the soil, we are uh, reducing water usage in some cases up to 70% just sharing. But one thing we want to keep in mind is we don't want mulch ever to be up around the crown of the plants. So we want the crown of trees and shrubs and perennials to be free of mulch, just a few inches, and then uh, we're good to go. And then it's always really important to uh, do our homework, to plant the right plant in the right place, to really make sure that the plants we choose to introduce to our garden are best suited for the conditions of our garden. We're all, we, we live in the Bay Area. We've heard about microclimates where we all live in this dynamic area of different microclimates. So that's why it's so important to make sure we're matching plants to the condition to your specific garden. Uh, of course, we like to choose climate appropriate plants. So choosing California natives or Mediterranean natives because they adapt to our summer dry climate. But remember that um, not all California natives or Mediterranean natives are equal. Some will require more water than others. So again, that's why it's so important to do our homework. We also want to match the plants to the space that's available and the other conditions of our garden. So if we only have a space that's two feet by two feet, then we really wanna make sure we're buying a plant that's only going to grow to one and a half feet by one and a half feet. We don't wanna overcrowd because overcrowded plants can also uh, become stressed and more uh, attractive to pest problems. Um, so we're always going to group plants by their needs once established. So plants that want full sun and no water once established will be planted together in one zone. Plants that want part sun, part shade and require moderate watering uh, once established will be in another zone and so forth. And um, I just like to invite you to consider planting uh, a variety of plants that support the complex food, food webs that surround us. You know, uh, growing healthy garden habitat is so important and understanding that all of the little critters that we see in our garden are playing a really important role in helping us keep the balance. You know, we want to invite the songbirds, invite the Western fence lizards, invite our pollinators. Uh, they're just all so important helping keeping that balance so we don't have to work so hard. 
And when we water, this one's a really tough one. This is a big, that's, I have programs the whole time. All I'm talking about is how to water. So when we water, we really want to understand we're watering those roots and we want to grow nice, deep roots and roots that expand out. And the roots are going to do that with water. We drive the roots wide with water and we drive roots down with water. So to encourage deep root systems, we need to water deeply. Something to keep in mind that it could take um, a year or so for perennials to become established. It could take three to five years for sh larger shrubs or trees. In some cases, larger trees, it could take longer than five years. So during that time, we want to baby that plant. We want to uh, baby those root zones and, and continue to encourage them to grow out and down. And we do that with water. We're always gonna be watering out the outer edges of that plant. That's called the uh, canopy edge or the drip line. And the reason why is because out there, you can see in the top right corner of this illustration, this is an illustration of a tree. This applies to just about any plant. We are going to always focus our watering out of those fibrous young root hairs. That's where the water gets focused and that's where our fertilizer get focused. We do not focus water at the crown or at the trunk. Watering at the trunk, it's not doing anything. It's the, the plant is not using that water. In fact, all you're doing is um, over time, possibly reducing the lifespan of that plant because now we're introducing potential crown rot and things like that. If we water shallowly and frequently, we're gonna have shallow roots and that uh, water evaporates, evaporates out quickly and that plant becomes dehydrated, becomes stressed. When we water deeply, irrigation system can break. We can have a heat wave that plant is still going to have hydration deeper down. And then practicing healthy garden maintenance. This one's really important. This one helps us when we're in the garden, uh, we are, this is where we can monitor. This is where that monitoring comes into play. This is that observation. It's getting out there and getting in between our plants and harvesting those food crops and picking up any fruit that's on the ground. I have apples in my backyard and I've got apples all over the place. All of a sudden they're just dropping. So I got to get out there and pick them up and get them out in the green waste bin, or you can put them in your home compost system as long as it's contained so rodents can't get into it. We're also going to remove any fungal spores. So uh, roses and other plants that have uh, some of the common diseases like black spot or rust, uh, peach leaf curl, um, shot hole fungus, we're going to remove those leaves and get them into the green waste bin because when they stay on site, even though those leaves might decompose, the spores of the fungal um, uh, pathogens will stay and then just transfer to the new growth next spring. We're going to always prune mindfully uh, and selectively. Remember, less is more. We want to support that habitat and make sure we're not pruning out a nest by accident. And when we're out and cleaning up the garden, it's a great time to look at the irrigation systems and make sure they're working well. And when we have pests and irrigation problems, we really want to address them straight away. Do not let them go too long. And now that we're moving towards fall, we're gonna leave the leaves. We're gonna leave the leaves. And if we have pruned off any larger branches, we can leave them too. Maybe make them border a walkway or a path in our garden. And the reason why is because um, of course, we don't want leaves on the lawn or, or ground covers. We wanna rake those away. But in other areas of the garden, it's nature's mulch. It is free mulch. And then, um, Keeping rainwater on site is now a big part of uh, a healthy garden and integrated pest management. Uh, there are some rebates, as we've already seen, that are going to help support this. Uh, when we can keep rainwater on site, um, gosh, there are just so many benefits. We are going to now be able to um, actually... When we can avoid getting having all that rainwater go into the storm drain, and on site, 
it's going in deeper. It's uh, penetrating and infiltrating deeper down so it can recharge the soil deeper down, which can now access and recharge those deeper rooted trees and shrubs. Okay, so they can have access to it. Um, we can now uh, recharge aquifers, groundwater, things like that. We can uh, create rain gardens or swales to kind of move and redirect the water so it can go where we want it to. Uh, when we can keep water on site, we're actually reducing the need uh, or the reliability on the municipal water source. So that means there's more water uh, for everybody else or for us when we need it, you know, for our households and so forth. We don't need to use it out in the landscape. Um, when we can keep water on site, it absolutely saves us money, but it also uh, prevents flooding and pollution that might then run off into our storm drains. And then, uh, yes, this is another new slide I'm adding to my programs in regards to integrated pest management, is we are now always looking at keeping our landscapes fire safe. So we want firescaping is now very much a common practice throughout California, even in our more uh, densely populated urban areas. Unfortunately, we always have to have to think about this. So we, again, as I mentioned before, we're gonna clear plant material around from the house and other structures, because not only does this review, reduce fire risks, it reduces those pest problems that I mentioned before. It reduces access or um, the, it reduces that invitation for, has to come into the house. Um, and in that zone one, we only want non-combustible materials within the first five foot of perimeter around. Um, that would be gravel, decomposed granite, um, things like that. And then mulch and other materials out beyond that. All right. Cultural controls are always the biggest part of the program. So uh, the other sections are gonna be a little smaller and we'll go through them uh, with a little bit more ease, but that was a lot already, okay? So take a sip of your water or your tea. All right, let's dive into mechanical controls or physical controls. So these are the tools we use to prevent pest problems from coming in. So these are a few tools that uh, I love to remind folks to keep pests out of our houses, our homes, uh, wherever we live. These are some very simple, inexpensive, and very effective tools we can use. Hardware cloth. Hardware cloth is galvanized wire, uh, like fencing material. We put quarter inch over vents to prevent rodents from coming in. But we can also use eighth inch hardware cloth around attic vents to prevent yellow jackets, wasps, and fire embers. Okay, so lots of different uh, uh, sizes for hardware cloth, and we would be preventing different pests with that, which we'll look at again in a moment. Door sweeps uh, are the number one way to prevent crawling insects from coming into our house. Amazing. Uh, sealing up cracks and crevices with a fresh bead of caulk also prevents uh, crawling insects from coming in. Weather stripping is another wonderful tool we can use that prevents uh, pests from coming in, but also locks in our uh, heat or our air conditioning, so it's going to save us money. Uh, the sheet metal corners that I find at the hardware store, usually around where you get um, materials to build or patch a gutter, rain gutter around the eaves of your uh, roof. These are very inexpensive and easy to block points of entry by rodents. And then of course, uh, screens in the windows and doors prevent flying insects. Amazing. And then more barriers outside, we would look at netting or row cover to prevent uh, critters from accessing our food crops. Right now, driving around the Napa Valley, I see net over all the grapes to prevent the birds. So, you know, if, if they're doing it, you know it works. So a really easy, simple solution to prevent a lot of things from accessing our food. Um, of course, gopher baskets to prevent gophers from eating the root zones. Uh, copper tape barrier to prevent slug, slugs and snails from accessing our plants. Of course, deer fencing to prevent deer and other critters. Um, and then scare tape is uh, really excellent for uh, fruit trees. It is not a barrier, but it's a very good deterrent that is extremely effective. 
And then we're always thinking about exclusion. How can we keep unwanted critters from getting into uh, areas of the garden or the home that we don't want? So uh, again, the eighth inch hardware cloth would be for yellow jackets and wasps. A uh, quarter inch hardware cloth would be for rats and mice. You'll see the frame in the middle that is uh, hinged and has doors that open up. That's over a raised bed. That is quarter inch hardware cloth to prevent rodents from accessing that food. Half inch hardware cloth, we would line raised beds to prevent gophers or make gopher baskets or similar. Squirrels, we would use three quarter inch fencing or poultry wire or similar uh, to prevent squirrels from either digging and cats, digging on the soil, or we can make little baskets like the cloche on the lower right to go over food crops to prevent squirrels and other critters from accessing those. And then of course, deer fencing, it really needs to be seven feet or taller because they can jump right over it. Sheet mulching is another great barrier, uh, excellent way to reduce weeds, to get rid of a lawn um, and to re regenerate your soil. And it's very inexpensive, but another great uh, barrier that sometimes we don't even consider. And then other barriers would look at uh, barriers that we can utilize to protect plants from sun. This year has been not as, uh, I'm cross my fingers, let's just hope we don't have an excessive heat uh, event, but last year we had uh, excessive heat, uh, which really did a lot of damage, a lot of sun scald, a lot of sunburn on our plants. So something to keep in mind, we live in California and our full sun is very hot. So, uh, you know, this is great opportunity to, uh, you know, our young fruit trees or young ornamental trees that are newly planted. We want to paint those trunks with uh, arbor paint, or you can use latex paint, any light color will do. We're gonna mix it 50-50 with water and paint the trunk up to where the uh, branches start to grow uh, out. And then um, also utilizing shade cloth. Typically what we're looking at any, if they like about 30 or 40% shade will do. And as you see in this picture, uh, this photograph, it's tented. It's tented, so there's going to be nice airflow, but that shade cloth is going to help protect these full sun-loving plants from too much sun. So, or it's a case of a neighbor's tree was removed and what used to be a full shade garden is now full sun. My goodness, let's get some shade cloth up so that we can transition those plants and make uh, and adjust the garden uh, accordingly. Uh, and then another part of mechanical controls is working with traps. There are so many traps out there. We've got snail traps, gopher traps, rodent traps, mice, rats, sticky traps for uh, white flies and other insects. And of course, yellow jacket, fly trap, and, uh, and fly traps. Lots of traps out there, all shapes and sizes, and they work very well. So then another component of IPM is inviting beneficial organisms. So biological controls. We want to uh, invite the beneficial insects, the pollinators, the birds, and the other garden allies, okay? So they are doing a big service to us, either preying on um, uh, the pest insects or pollinating our flowers so we can increase our flowers and food crops, higher yields, or there's parasitoids. Uh, Insects such as wasps and flies that parasitize, they will go into the larvae and um, eat the inside of that larvae and merge later as the adults mature uh, wasp or fly. It's kind of crazy, but they're all out there in the garden uh, doing a great job for us. So something else to keep in mind is when we are trying to grow biodiversity and invite beneficial organisms, we really want to avoid using pesticides, even eco-friendly ones, because these guys are very vulnerable to those products. How do we invite beneficials? We're going to grow biodiversity. We're gonna choose plants that attract beneficial insects and pollinators and plant the largest variety possible. So what that looks like is um, in addition to all your favorites, 
we're going to introduce flowers that look like daisies or, sun or sunflowers. The reason why is because that sunflower might look like one flower to us, but those petals are actually rays and the flowers are what's in the inside, all those little tiny flowers. Um, and that's really important because uh, a lot of our beneficials and our pollinators are tiny and they like to kind of comb through the small flowers. Uh, something I'll share that I, I haven't mentioned yet is the reason why beneficial insects such as ladybugs require uh, flowers like this is because um, they are also nectar feeders. They're also pollen feeders. Our lace wings are pollen and nectar feeders. Uh, many of the adult versions of the beneficial insects are going to be looking for pollen and nectar. And oftentimes it's just the larval stage of the beneficial insect that's going for that protein meal for that insect it wants to consume like aphids. So that's, um, that's something I, I neglected to mention. But then the other uh, flower type we'd like to have in our uh, garden are flowers that grow in little tiny clusters. So flowers that might look like yarrow, clusters of small flowers, or ceanothus, or lavender, or sweet alyssum, and so forth. These are all going to really uh, benefit so many of the beneficial organisms we see in the garden. And then lastly, it's chemical controls. So something I just want to share is that the pesticides don't solve the pest problem. They just kill the pest. Very good at killing the pest. So um, the pesticides won't have a long lasting uh, solution uh, to the problem if the cause isn't addressed. So we always really wanna understand the why. Why is this problem happening, okay? Because if the conditions um, continue to favor the pest or the disease, they're just gonna come back. The pesticides are only going to uh, offer a brief respite. So understand that even organic pesticides are not solving the problem, okay? So that's just something to keep in mind. But when we use pesticides, remember I mentioned we're always gonna use them as a last resort. We're always gonna use uh, less toxic and eco-friendly products. We're applying those products in accordance to the label. And side note, if that pest isn't on the label, that product's not gonna work for that pest. Uh, we're always gonna wear our PPE and we're going to understand the risks and unintended consequences. There are so many eco-friendly products on the market. I started uh, working in the garden industry um, in the 90s, long time ago. And there really weren't any, uh, or not as much as there are now. We had insecticidal soap, we had horticultural oil, and there was neem, but it wasn't as popular as it is now. But what I'm sharing is that there's biopesticides, there's uh, horticultural soaps and horticultural oils and uh, pesticides um, made from botanical. Uh, so just so many, and it's kind of cool. But it's really important that we know how the pesticides are intended to work. Uh, so again, we always want to read that label, but insecticidal soap or horticultural soap is potassium salts of fatty acids. Um, that's the active ingredient. It is a contact kill. It needs to make contact with the insect to kill it. It is narrow spectrum. That means it only is going to kill a very short list of pests, uh, mostly soft bodied. And um, it is not dish detergent. So a lot of times people will think about make their own like DIY. Do not use dish detergent. Dish detergent has um, degreasers and surfactants that actually will strip the outer coating of the plant uh, and possibly uh, cause some harm. And this goes for uh, any dish detergent, if it's eco dish detergent or not. So just sharing. Neem oil. Uh, Clarified hydrophobic extracts of neem. There's also pure neem out there right now. It's, we're starting to see that on the market. Uh, but this is also a contact kill. It's, it's the, that pesticide has to make contact with the organism to kill it. And in some cases, neem is a little slower uh, working. It could take about four days before we see those insect pests die. It is very broad spectrum. It is considered an insecticide, fungicide, and miticide. So sometimes it's called a three-in-one. And just recently, we're seeing some neem oils on the market that are called four-in-ones, including grubs. So uh, there are some products that will have uh, 
the ability and the instructions to use as a soil drench. But again, those are very specific. So you have to make sure you get the very one, the exact one. Not all means will have that property. So again, broad spectrum. What does that mean? It's got a more of a risk of killing beneficial insects. All right, spinosad or spinosad. This is very popular. Um, this is a, a pesticide that we has really grown in popularity in the last uh, 10 years. It is actually a bacterium which disrupts the insect's uh, neurotransmission, okay? They need to ingest it. So it has to be ingested. So this is only gonna work on insects that have chewing mouth parts or rasping mouth parts. What has rasping mouth parts? Spider mites and thrips, okay? This is not going to work for aphids. This is not going to work for white flies, okay? So this is very specific. So that's why it's so important to read that label to make sure that pest is on the label. It is also very broad spectrum, which means it is going to also potentially impact beneficial insects. Uh, something else that's very important when we read that label of any product that contains spinosad, it's going to say on that label that it's limited to only six applications a year. So we have to be very strategic with that pesticide. And the reason why this is on the label is to prevent pesticide resistance. Very important. All right, tips for using pesticides. We want to understand that mode of action. What I just shared, I only went through three pesticides, the most common ones that people uh, like to use, but there are very, there are many different types of pesticides out there and there's different types of mode of action. Does it need to get ingested? Is it a contact kill? How does it work? Do critters need to walk over it? Um, and then we want to understand that less toxic products can take longer. In the case of the neem, it could take up to four days before we see insects dead. So sometimes people go, oh, it didn't work. Well, it did, it did work. It just didn't work immediately. Okay. So timing is also important. We want to understand that pest life cycle and then target the pesticide at the appropriate life cycle. So are we targeting the larvae or do we need to target the adult? And what product would we need to use? What mode of action would work best for the different stages of that insect. We always want to spot treat. We're only targeting the pests on the plant. We're not spraying down the whole garden. Pests are very host specific. So the aphids that are on my rows are not going to jump over to my chard or my kale or my milkweed, okay? They're very host specific. Now my milkweed might get some aphids, but that's a different aphid. We're applying at dusk or the end of the day when um, the temperatures have cooled, those four o'clock winds have died down and our beneficial insects are less likely to be active. And then if we are releasing beneficial insects, we wanna give them some time. We wanna let them do their thing and trust that they are gonna keep that balance before we start applying pesticides. And it's also important to understand the unintended consequences. So no pesticide is risk-free. Okay, so regardless if it's synthetic or eco-friendly, and especially if it's one you've made at home, we just need to really know what we're doing. Also understand we never spray pesticides when there's a little breeze of five miles an hour or more because it can drift onto non-targeted plants and cause damage. Can also, uh, there's risk of contamination of soil or groundwater when used improperly or when overused. And also uh, some pesticides can damage the soil microbiology and more is not better. I just had a person I was helping the other day at a retailer. It's like, I'm gonna double the dose. The last time it didn't work. Well, that's not how it works. Please do not uh, double the dose. You can uh, mix the pesticides in accordance to what the label says to keep you safe and to keep your environment safe. And please always wear your PPE. Now we don't have to get super suited up, but boy, we can have a dermal reaction just from neem. So wear non-cotton gloves, long sleeves, pants, boots, or you know shoes that we wanna make sure we're covering our skin and um, understand what the active ingredient is. If you are using products that aren't eco-friendly, sometimes it's really important to wear a respirator. Doesn't have to be heavy duty. It could be, you know, uh, a mask, but we really want to make sure we're not breathing in some of these products, nor are we getting them in our eyes. 
And then one of the fun things I like to add is what do we do with products that we no longer want? We're going to take them to our local household hazards waste facility. If you don't know where that is, you could just do an online search, household hazards waste, the city you live in, and that information will come up. It's free. It's easy. It's always a lot of fun. I don't know why, but I love going to household hazards waste facilities. All right. So let's finish up by talking about applying IPM techniques. So what was the first step of integrated pest management that I mentioned before? Do you know? Do you remember? Identification. If we can't identify what's going on, we can't solve the problem. So uh, proper identification is key. Um, and then once we can identify uh, what's going on, we can either fix the problem or if it's a pest, we can identify it as that pest. We want to understand its life cycle. We want to understand its habitat, its timing of when we might see it. Um, and then we want to look around and see, are there any natural enemies? Are there any beneficials around that might be preying on these pests? So this is some things to consider before we go for uh, a pesticide. And remember that some pests are seasonal and be expected. So pests are food for the beneficials, with help, which helps keep that healthy balance that I keep mentioning. And sometimes we just need to reevaluate our thresholds of tolerance. Remember what I mentioned before? Plants can handle quite a bit of pest activity. It's oftentimes us that get in the way. And an infestation of a pest can also be a clue that something isn't working or that a plant is stressed out and that we actually, uh, it, it's actually doing us a favor to show us that there's something going on, like maybe an irrigation break or, you know, and, you know, maybe a plant is not planted in the right place or something happened. So a couple of things, pest identification is not easy uh, and it is really easy to uh, kind of get triggered or to want to react when we're out in the garden. So I've got a couple slides of Pester Pals. So this is a serpent fly larva uh, that I love seeing on my roses. This is why I get excited about aphids is because when I see um, aphids, I know I'm going to have beneficials. And this is like a little worm, a little caterpillar that's very tiny, anywhere from a quarter of an inch to half an inch is pretty big. That's pretty mature, but usually they're a little smaller. They have that little white racing stripe on their back and they love aphids. So when I see this guy on my roses, I'm very happy and I do not squish them. So these two critters look very similar. This is a mealybug destroyer feeds on mealybugs and other insects. Flea beetle feeds on foliage of seedlings and leafy greens. Good bug, bad bug. Whew, very they look identical that they do two different things. And then this is a very common one that we see around the Bay Area. We see this on our fruit trees in the spring. Um, what do we do? Do you know what it is? This is aphids, aphids puckering the leaves of a plum it's an insect. And this is peach leaf curl, which is a fungal disease that puckers the leaves of peaches and nectarines and only peaches and nectarines. So two very different pests. A one we would use an insecticide like insecticidal soap. The other we would use a fungicide like a uh, 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 copper soap or something like that. All right. So I've got four pests that I've prepared to go through really quick. We've got ants. Ants outside are decomposers. They aerate the soil. They also eat other insect pests. But they're kind of a nuisance and a lot of times they bug us. We don't always like to see a lot of ants cruising around because oftentimes we're just like, ah, there's a problem. But ants are really good at protecting aphids and keeping beneficial insects away. So when we see ants trailing up a tree, that's usually an indicator that something else is going on. So we kind of want to address that. So outdoor, we're going to manage aphids, scale, and other pest insects, because that's what those ants are telling us. They're telling us that there's some pests uh, in that tree or in that shrub, like the butylon or the citrus or whatever. So when we see ants, that's our indicator. That's our clue. Hey, thanks ants. I'm going to go in and I'm going to manage what the problem is. Um, we can use uh, sticky traps or we can use uh, products like Tanglefoot 
or sticky insect glue to make a barrier around the trunk to prevent the, the ants from crossing. We could use ant bait stations uh, such as the taro, that's going to be the boric acid in a sugar bait. We can use uh, diatomaceous earth, uh, which works as a desiccant on their exoskeleton. Those are all great tools. Indoors, when we see them cruising around our countertops and such, we want to kill those scouts and we want to clean up those scent trails, right? We want to tidy up any crumbs. We want to make sure that we don't have any water sources or uh, we don't have any pet food hanging around. Uh, if we do and we need to keep the pet food out there, we're going to actually put that pet food bowl with the food in it into a larger bowl that has a little bit of water. Now we have a moat around the pet food and the ants will not cross that moat of water. We are going to seal up cracks and crevices with caulk or similar. We're gonna put that new weather stripping around the doors and windows. And if we need to use a pesticide, we can use ant bait stations. They're excellent. Um, the ant bait stations that will have, again, that boric acid in the sugar bait or the hydromethylene or similar. We can also use powdered boric acid in cracks and crevices or uh, in the frame of the wall, things like that. Um, cause again, it's a powder, they'll walk over it. They'll ingest it that way. Cause they're grooming insects. We want to keep it out of reach of anybody else. And if we need to use a spray, there's so many great eco pesticides on the market, such as orange guard. All right. Gophers, gophers eat the roots of plants. All right. So, um, we always want to make sure we're planting plants in gopher baskets that we've made or that we've purchased and that we're always lining raised beds again with that half inch hardware cloth. We're going to monitor for activity. We can eliminate populations or reduce populations significantly by using traps. And the way we use traps is to be persistent, okay? If we need to watch that movie Caddyshack, go ahead, but then we're gonna come back and we're gonna be persistent because you can have a lot of success with traps when they're used correctly and when we're persistent. And then there are some really great repellents on the market, such as castor oil repellents, like this Molmax. But these are just going to be temporary deterrents. They're very effective. They need to be used in accordance to the label because they're very specific how we apply them. But um, they're just temporary deterrents. So just keep that in mind. Moles. We're gonna start to see a lot of mole activity. Moles. Um, are actually eating uh, other insects in the soil. So they're cruising around eating insects, such as grubs. So when we can, when we see mole activity, what we wanna do is remove the food source. When we can remove the grubs, then we're not gonna see the moles, all right? So we do that by applying beneficial nematodes uh, because they will feed on those grubs and um, those grubs will no longer be there. Thus, the moles will not be there. We can also work with traps, but I'll share from a lot of experience. The traps are not as easy. It's a little bit more challenging to uh, reduce or eliminate moles with traps. Okay, just a side note. Uh, but the castor oil repair repellents are very effective and they work really well, again, as that temporary deterrent. So how many of you are starting to see this? I've already saw a couple people today that said that their, uh, their lawns, their turf areas are starting to get rolled up. Well, this is one culprit, our little raccoon friend, or maybe not so much of a friend. We're also gonna see skunks out there making whirls in the lawn and the turf areas. So similar to the moles, they're going for the grubs. So we wanna keep our turf areas healthy. When our turf areas are healthy, we will not have grubs. When we don't have grubs, we're not gonna have these critters looking for grubs. So, so what we've done is we've trained these critters that they can get food at our gardens. The raccoons are very smart and they're going to be repeat offenders until they know for a fact there is no food possible. Uh, we're going to exclude. So putting down poultry wire as in this picture, this photograph behind, Poultry wire is very inexpensive. It's very lightweight. And oftentimes the areas that are getting hit with this activity from these critters is not that big, 
Okay. Maybe it's three by five, three feet by five feet or something similar. So it's manageable. It's usually not the entire turf area. So we put the poultry wire down. We can also use bird netting, but poultry wire is a little easier to manage. We can put bricks or some type of weight on the corners, or we can use landscape pins to anchor it down. All right. We also want to make sure we're removing those food sources and uh, treating those grubs with beneficial nematodes, right? So those are some important tips that we're going to be all be faced with. So beneficial nematodes, if you're not familiar with them, you can learn more about them online. These are some resources, organiccontrol.com, rinconvitova.com, or tiptopbiocontrol.com. All great organizations or businesses that you can order them from. And then there are more on them uh, out there. This is the three common ones that we see. And this is a fungus gnat larvae getting attacked by beneficial nematodes. So that is how tiny they are. Remarkable. So yes, they work. Cats and squirrels, I mentioned, we're going to cover that soil and those planting beds with that poultry wire, just like we did for the raccoons to prevent them from digging, or cat scat mats. These are a thing, you can order them online. You can also use that bird netting, but as I mentioned, not as easy to manage. And there are some repellents on the market that work really well, cat scram and then um, critter ritter, but again, they're temporary deterrents. Yellow jackets been a big year for yellow jackets. They have really been doing well. Um, we want to get those traps out in uh, March. We can put them out now. Yes, please don't hesitate. But what we want to do is put them out in March when the trees are still dormant, as you can see this picture. And the reason why is because the mated females will leave the trap very, or leave the nest very soon. And uh, mated females, when they leave that nest or get kicked out, they are now queens. The queens are going to overwinter. They're going to hibernate. They look like supersized yellow jackets. Oftentimes we see them in the fabric of the patio umbrella that's down for the winter or the cover on the barbecue grills or on the patio furniture or in um, wood piles and so forth. When we see them and they're sleeping like this, you can just squish them. I'm not brave enough. That's why I get my husband to do it. But they, once we start to get those nice warm temperatures in March, we have a nice warm weekend where it's like 75, 80. We still might have frosty days and more rain. But when we get those nice warm days in March, it's when the queens start to emerge. They break dormancy. They're looking for a place to make a nest. Every queen we capture in that trap, it's thousands of yellow jackets we've prevented. So it is important to put these yellow jacket traps out in the early, late winter, early spring each year. Some resources that might help you out with pest management is, of course, the Our Water, Our World program, where it has a nice small catalog of easy to understand and read uh, how to's on pest management. Our Water, Our World does partner with the University of California. So this is a little bit more user friendly. But then for more in-depth information, and of course, for uh, many more topics, a huge library, gigantic searchable database, it's the University of California, UCIPM, statewide uh, website. It's amazing. For information and support with pest identification, bugguide.net is going to be your go-to. And for information on how active ingredients work on your pesticides, the mode of action and so forth, it's going to be the National Pesticide Information Center. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd love to take any of your questions. And of course, if questions come up later on, please don't hesitate to reach out. I am Suzanne at plantharmony.org, or you can go to my website and visit me on uh, Instagram. Sometimes I've got some fun pest problems going on. Thanks, Suzanne. I see a couple of questions in the Q&A. The first question is about a backyard being infected with mice. And they want to know if they could hire a professional to identify the type and address it effectively and safely, or if you have any other suggestions. Can you um, just repeat the very first part? What was the pest problem? I didn't catch that part. Mites, M-I-T-E-S. Okay, mites. So um, a couple questions are, is it rodent mites, poultry mites, um, uh, other um, 
other birds beyond chickens, uh, mites. Um, there's a lot of different types of mites out there. So sometimes we can just me list, making that list, you can identify, yes, I know it was rat mites. We had a rat problem, totally gross, but it happens. Or we had uh, pigeons on the roof and uh, mites from them were coming in like a skylight. I mean, we kind of get the idea once we understand that there's different types of mites. I would encourage you to go, encourage you to, go to the University of California UCIPM website. Um, but ways to manage mites, let's say it is poultry mites in the chicken coop. Um, there's products like first Saturday lime that is uh, readily available at like Home Depot or other uh, farm supply. Uh, there's also products like diatomaceous earth. Uh, these are products that will work as desiccants against the spider mites. I'm sorry, against the mites. Um, we just want to make sure we're not breathing them in. They're not toxic, but we don't. Fine dust can be lung irritants. Um, we want to, inside the house, uh, you know, just do a real deep clean. Get uh, everything into the wash, but more importantly, into the hot dryer for no less than 30 minutes. When we have things in the hot dryer, they don't have to go through the wash, such as like a wool sweater. Can just go in the hot dryer for no less than 30 minutes. It's going to kill all stages of that insect, all stages, the larvae and the adult of like the moth, for instance. So that would be the next step. And then from there, uh, sealing up any cracks and crevices with caulk or wood putty and so forth, because you really want to seal inside the house. So uh, deep clean inside. And then there's some really great products to use outside. Yeah. And I'm really sorry, really sorry that you're faced with that. Great, thank you. And everyone who has questions, if, feel free to, to raise your hand if you'd like to expand on your question as well, and we can unmute you. Okay, our next question, is there a bigger list of which plants attract more beneficial predators? Hans would like to make a mix of biodiversity in their balcony or garden. The weather is very nice. Oh, yes. Um, and gosh, I realized I didn't put that slide up, but, um, uh, California native plant society has an awesome database. It's called bloom California or Cal scapes, C A L scapes, Cal scapes. I love that website. It will help me identify what type of wildlife I want to attract or what type of beneficial, um, organisms I want to attract. And then it'll list the plants. Uh, your local master gardeners will, um, so if you're Santa Clara County, you would just do master gardener, Santa Clara County. If you're San Mateo County, same, you know, um, you see master gardeners and then the county that you're in, they're going to have a really great list of uh, plants that are going to attract those beneficial insects. The Our Water, Our World website will have a really cool handout that call it's called um, Healthy Gardens. And then um, there might be a link to the 10 most wanted beneficial insects in the garden, but I'm not sure if that's on there at the moment. But yeah, there are a lot of great resources for you. Great. We have a question about coffee grounds and peppermint oil. Do they, do they work as rodent repellent? If yes, how, how much and for how long and how to best apply them? Um, all right, so now we're kind of uh, like creeping into the DIYs. And I just wanna say I am super uh, hesitant to ever recommend or suggest DIYs because there's a lot of room for error and there's a lot of room for injuring yourself. Uh, peppermint oil is pretty strong and gosh, you know, you can actually burn your skin. You can burn your eyes a little bit. It could be an eye irritant and a lung irritant. Um, peppermint oil is one of the active ingredients that we see in, um, some rodent repellents. Uh, it is very effective. However, again, it's a temporary deterrent. So if I have a rodent problem, or if I have, um, you know, I see mice in my garage, 
I want to take action and make sure I, I have gone through all those cardboard boxes. I know that they're not nesting in my garage. It's a lot of effort. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm actually faced with it right now. Um, it took us a whole weekend. My husband and I just not even clearing everything out of the garage, just one corner. We discovered the access and we had to close it up. And now we've got traps out there. But I, there's another area we have to tackle again. Um, that's next step. So um, big effort, but you, you have to address the cause. You really have to uh, manage the pest. The repellents will be temporary deterrents. Um, I know mint plants, when we plant mint, though it grows and it runs, it will prevent gophers from coming into areas. They won't cross that. Um, and then uh, for coffee grounds, I... I would say, please just put the coffee grounds in your home compost. Um, that's a great use for home, uh, for coffee grounds. Get them in your home compost. Do not sprinkle them around your plants um, because there's actually risk of burning um, plant material if it comes in contact with it because as the coffee grounds start to decompose, the bacteria that's decomposing the coffee grounds kind of heat up and it can actually burn root zones or uh, plant parts. So just use some caution. <laughs> Great, we have a question about how to prevent apple moth. Oh, coddling moth. Uh, I think it might, it's, it gives it, I hope, okay, I'm gonna address coddling moth. There could be another um, apple maggot, uh, but coddling moth is very uh, common around here. Um, sadly, and you manage that in the spring. So when your apple tree is at three quarter petal drop, when it's almost completely done with the petals and some of the apples on the tree are about the size of a pea, like a little green pea, um, and we still have some petals on the tree is when we put out the coddling moth traps. So it's always advisable to purchase your coddling moth traps way ahead of time. So even um, November, December, January, awesome. Come March, when our trees are in flower, oftentimes the coddling moth traps are sold out and we're gonna use those as an indicator to see when there's activity. And there's a lot of information on the University of California. So I invite you to go to their website and look at coddling moths because uh, it's very specific. And then from there, once we have uh, a lot of activity, um, we see a lot of coddling moth adults in that trap is when we're going to start to apply products like the spinosad, that product I mentioned before. But remember, I, I mentioned we have to use it very strategically because we only get to use it um, six times a year. So we're going to apply that um, spinosad and then a week later or in accordance to the label, I believe it says to apply once a week, we're going to apply it again. And then we can even do a third application, but then we have to stop replace those coddling moth traps with fresh ones so we can monitor. Um, and then we know we've managed the problem. The, another way to manage coddling moth without even using the pesticide is to go around and bag the apples with paper bags um, or mesh bags. And then the apples can grow inside the bag. And now we've created a barrier so that no um, larvae uh, the adults can't lay the egg, the larvae can't um, get into the apple. So there's a couple other tricks out there. So you can, um, you know, you'll, you'll do some reading and you'll learn some tricks, but yes, please avoid using the pesticides at all costs, and especially don't use pesticides when the trees are in full bloom because our pollinators are still visiting. We have a question about black ants in the house and the best way to terminate them. Okay, so we went through a slide and addressed that where we want to, uh, any scouts we might see, we're gonna clean those up. If you are lucky enough to see the point of entry, how they're coming in, we're gonna seal that hole. We're either gonna fill it in with a fresh bead of caulk, 
even just putting like some um, masking tape over the hole will be a temporary fix. We can put fresh weather stripping around the door to block their entry. So those are all things. But from personal experience, it's rare that we ever see how they're coming in. So uh, working with the um, the bait stations, the traps, um, the bait stations where they come and take the bait and they bring it back to the colony. They feed everybody and everybody dies. It re reduces that colony and that population. Uh, so that's why I showed the um, taro liquid amp bait. Um, there's rescue liquid amp bait. There's also Maggie's farm. Um, Harris even has a liquid amp bait. There's a lot out there. So you wanna make sure it's the boric acid and um, they're gonna have sugar uh, attractants to attract the ants. The ants love it. They're going to be um, hitting that trap pretty hard for a couple days. Some might even die in the trap because it's like they're overdosing on the sugar. Um, they don't make it back, but enough will make it back. And then after a couple of days, the activity is done and you can just clean up the, the bait station and you should be good to go. I have see another question about yellow jackets. Is it true that yellow jackets die off over winter and do not return to a prior year's nest? Um, that is correct. So the whole colony is going to die off and only that mated female will live. So she leaves the nest. Now she's officially a queen and she is going to hibernate. The whole rest of that nest is going to perish. It is going to die. So, um, I personally am waiting for, I have an in-ground nest this year. I have it fenced off so that my dogs can't access it. We've got traps hanging there. Um, I did not put the yellow jacket traps out this spring because I hadn't had activity for a couple of years. So now I know we got to do it every year, but um, yeah, the whole nest is going to die. We have a question about raccoons. Raccoons are coming to their attic through a hole. How do we deter raccoons? Um, they have a, a water feature that raccoons are coming to, to play in and they, it ruins the, yeah. the lilies and the, the water. So um, you want to eliminate the access to the water feature. So if they're, um, so some uh, people I know that have water features and they love them like a pond or something, they actually have a fence. Um, it's not that elaborate, but they have a fence that they put around and then, then the top is netted or that top has that poultry wire and it's connected to the fence. So it's something they put up every night to prevent the raccoons. Again, remember we're, we wanna train them that they cannot get what they want. Uh, because so far they've been getting what they want, but that is a problem for us. If there's a hole on the fence, we want to plug that hole, but understand raccoons can climb over objects. So um, that, that that's going to be the best um, tactic at the moment is to exclude them the best you can. We have a question about leaf miners in citral, citrus plants, specifically navel oranges. Um, so those are very common, um, citrus leaf miner. It's a little moth that li lays its eggs on the back of the leaves. The leaves like look like little, I'm sorry, the eggs look like little mini grains of rice. We can go through and start inspecting. Remember that, uh, graph I showed you at the beginning, the circle, we start to inspect and monitor, um, and we can scrape those uh, eggs off with our fingernail. We can just pluck those leaves off, but really just squishing the eggs is enough. Even if the egg hatches and the larvae is now between the two layers of the leaves, you can go around and squish the larvae. Kind of gross, but very effective. Um, the larvae is mining between the two layers of the leaf eating um, and enjoying all those delicious juices of the cells. And then it will emerge later as the adult and start the cycle again. 
So there are citrus leaf miner traps out there, just like the coddling moth traps. Those are helpful because they'll reduce the populations. It's a pheromone lure. Um, uh, and then something to keep in mind, um, the citrus, um, good news is that the citrus leaf miner is only affecting the leaves unless it's um, the varieties of citrus where you want to eat the leaves just the navel orange or other, you know, like Meyer lemons and so forth. It's not affecting the fruit. The fruit is still growing. We can still harvest the fruit. We can still eat the fruit. So though it might be unsightly, the fruit is still extremely edible. The plant is still able to photosynthesize. So that is going to be the important component here. If the plant has so much leaf miner that now it's actually uh, threatening the health of the plant, threatening the health that cannot photosynthesize well enough, then that's a problem, yes. So before it gets to that point, you would want to maybe take some action. We could look at um, spraying with neem oil, uh, alternating neem and spinosad. Spinosad has some um, anti, I'm sorry, some sublaminate qualities where it will absorb into the, the cells of the leaves so that that larvae still can access and in, ingest it. But you want to alternate with neem because you only get to use it six times a year. If you sprayed neem one week, spinosad the next week, neem week three, spinosad week four, that's a whole month of a pesticide um, strategy, which would be more than enough. But we want to make sure when we're applying those pesticides, we're getting underneath the leaves, getting underneath the leaves of citrus. Citrus oftentimes grow really densely, not easy to get good coverage. Making sure your citrus is healthy, watering it deeply at the drip line, not watering again until the top few inches is dried, feeding with organic fertilizer, protecting that root so it mulch, increasing the health of your citrus will make your citrus more resilient to the citrus leaf miner. So um, yeah, that's my kind of long answer. Great. Okay, um, we have another question about yellow jackets. Okay. Suggestions for dealing with a ground wasp nest. Um, they, they're worried that someone might get stung and they, they tried a peppermint and oil dish liquid that didn't work so that they want to know what to do with this, this ground um, right. wasp nest. Okay, so um, just clarify, is the, the um, pesticide that you applied to the nest, was it something you purchased or is it something you made yourself? Miss O, do you want to raise your hand and talk? But it, it sounds like something they, they made themselves. Okay. So um, I'm not, I don't, there's no pointing fingers or shame, but homemade remedies, these recipes we see on the internet, oftentimes they really miss the mark. So um, I'm really, uh, I apologize that you put so much effort into it. And I know that you sincerely thought it would work, but it's, it's not going to work. And actually you want to be really careful because you can actually cause more harm to yourself. Um, the other thing is in ground nests, uh, local vector control, which is a county um, agency will come and remove in ground nests for free at no charge. The nest just cannot be attached to a structure. So they will not touch any nests that are attached to structures like a home or a garage or something. But in ground nest, they will come and remove for free. You just have to flag it or identify it somehow. Um, in the meantime, there are eco-friendly yellow jacket and wasp sprays um, that are very effective. However, from my experience right now, Everybody is sold out of everything, but just so you know, um, and from what I'm hearing from consumers, from uh, landscapers and other gardeners, the eco-friendly yellow jacket and wasp sprays are more effective than the synthetic ones. 
I'm not sure if the yellow jackets have built up pesticide resistance, but the um, normal ones like by Raid or Spectricide or Hotshot, those brands, those are pyrethroids. Not only are they toxic to the waterways, um, I'm hearing that they're not really killing the whole nest, but the eco-friendly ones by Rescue, it's Rescue Y Spray, or safer brand yellow jacket and wasp spray. Zevo has a yellow jacket and wasp spray. I just saw it was on sale the other day at the Home Depot. That's on closeout. I couldn't believe it, but they're sold out. Um, Ecologic, Eco Smart, those are other brands. Uh, there's a lot of brands on the market, but the problem is you might not be, like I said, everybody's sold out right now. So to prevent someone from getting stung, you want to do something like I did. I put a fence around the nest and our neighbors, uh, my husband, they were out of town for uh, uh, several months. And my husband, we've been kind of watching the house for them, noticed an in-ground nest. He put a yellow uh, traffic cone over the entry. The yellow jackets did not like that, but they calmed down to tell, to show the neighbors, cause they have a toddler. We didn't want the toddler to get stung. Hey, there's a cone on this nest. Make sure your child avoids that area. Yellow jackets, if they don't feel that they're threatened or in harm's way, they will not be reactive. However, we absolutely don't want to put anybody in harm's way. We want to do all we can. You can currently put out yellow jacket traps to capture some of them. Uh, you, of course, will not get the entire nest, but I would uh, encourage you to reach out to Vector Control. There's a Vector Control in San Mateo County and also one in Santa Clara County or whatever county you live in. You can also hire uh, exterminators. So like um, there are several exterminators that have green or eco services, such as Western Exterminator. They will remove that in-ground nest. A uh, friend of mine was just looking into it. It was about $225 and they could come the next day and they gave her like a three hour window. Then she found somebody that was, um, it was like environmental uh, pest services or something. They were able to come the next day for $160. So less expensive and they gave even a more precise window of time. So there are uh, pest companies out there that will manage in ground yellow jacket nests. Um, it will cost you money and they do have green services. You just have to ask for them. To the vector control um, there as well. Okay, a couple more citrus questions. Sanjeev's orange tree is yellowing in the leaves. How does he make sure the leaves are green? And how often should he water the, the citrus and fertilize the, the orange tree? Okay, I appreciate your question, question. However, I'm not really able to answer it because it depends. First of all, there's different type of yellowing that citrus leaves uh, show. Sometimes it's from overwatering. Sometimes it's from nutrient deficiency. Sometimes it's um, from inadequate fertilizing and inadequate fertilizing. What I mean by overdoing it with synthetic fertilizers, uh, not having the right pH uh, so that the plant can't take up the nutrients. So a uh, couple of places to start is citrus are heavy feeders. They are evergreen. They like to get food. So if you have been fertilizing on a regular basis, then I recommend to start there, to start by fertilizing. Um, personally, I like to use the organic Job spikes. They're very easy to uh, put. You just hammer them into the soil around the drip line of your citrus. And then you don't have to worry about fertilizing for several months. Again, you want to read the directions, but organic job spikes are really easy to find and they're very inexpensive. From there, there's also some very good uh, quality organic fertilizers out there like down to earth, true organics, um, espoma. 
They are going to be great. They're granular. They're going to tell you to add maybe a cup or two. Um, it really depends on the diameter of the trunk. So for every inch the trunk is wide, that diameter will be like another cup of fertilizer. And again, you're going to scratch it in around that drip line of that plant, ideally underneath the mulch. Watering. Only you can dictate how much your plant is getting watered and if it's getting watered enough. Nobody else can tell you that. Nobody. Um, unless they're at the property with you. So you are going to water at that drip line deeply. So if you have an irrigation system currently, you're going to run that irrigation system. Let's say it's on for 30 minutes. After the irrigation system has completed its cycle, you're going to go out there and you're going to look. Did water get around the circumference of my tree, my citrus out here, the drip line? And how deep did that water get? I'm going to get my trowel and I'm going to see how deep did the water go? If it's an established mature citrus, you're going to want that water to have gotten down a good 12, 18 inches. You can start with eight inches and it will continue to uh, migrate down. But if you only have like two inches of uh, hydration depth, that's not enough. So there, there's your answer. Your plant's not getting enough water. If it is getting shallow water frequently. So I'm only watering my citrus about once every other week, but I'm watering it deeply. If you're watering it like every other day for 15, 20 minutes. That's another something to look at. Um, it's also important to put a nice layer of compost on top of the soil underneath the mulch. Um, so those are some things to start with. Those are some things to start with. You can always go to um, Summer Wind. I'm sorry, um, Four Winds. Is it Four Winds Citrus Growers? Uh, they're very helpful. But Summer Winds is a garden center down in your area. They're also very helpful. So, but uh, Four Winds is one of the uh, growers for citrus in our area, and their website has a lot of great information. Hey, I do want to recognize that it's 8.30. We, we can stay on a little longer for answering some more of these questions, but thank you to anyone who has to hop off and hope to see you at our upcoming uh, Rain Barrel class on September 30th. Yep. I see Erica has a question about and green. I'm, okay, I just want to share. I'm also teaching the September 20th fall planting program. So if you want more you want to hear more about what I have to share about fall planting, which will be kind of an extension of this program, join the September 20th program. But um, all right, I'm sorry. What was the question, Linda? Yes, join all of our classes. Um, Erica has a question on green bean flowers. They were completely shared off this year. Any idea which pest is responsible? Um, it could be rodents. It could be birds. Um, yeah, those would be my two first guesses, but hard to say. Hard to say. Sorry. Hopefully you got some green beans out of it. Hopefully they didn't nibble all the flowers. We have a question on neem on citrus. Huh? Should the fruit be removed or can it be eaten even though neem has been applied? Um, if you're applying pesticides, uh, even eco-friendly is always nice to read that label and see how often. What is the frequency of application before harvest? That's always going to be on the label. So it might say you can use same the day of harvest, or it might have to be a week before harvest. So you'll have to look at that. I personally don't use neem, so I can't answer that question from experience. I'd also say I would uh, I would advise you not to spray the fruit, though it might not have any toxicity, but it's such a pungent smell. I don't, I feel like, I mean, that's the main reason I don't use neem is because that scent is so strong. Anything I, if I bring those oranges in, my whole place would smell like <laughs> neem oil. If I needed to, uh, you know, um, grate the rind, um, that would just be getting neem in my mouth. You know what I mean? Like sometimes, I mean, and why do you need to spray the fruit? Can you uh, focus the pesticide more on the leaves if that's what you're trying to do? 
we have a question about root rot on blue star juniper plants. Um, how to control it and save the plant. What what is the pest? Root rot, you said? Yes, root root rot. Oh, root rot, R-O-T. Um, well, if you already have root rot on your juniper, that plant is most likely a goner. I'm, I don't, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Junipers are extremely, um, water wise. They are, you know, very low water once established. And so if we've been watering them frequently, especially if we've had that emitter right at the base of the trunk. Yeah, that's what happened. It was inappropriate watering that, uh, reduced its lifespan. So you most likely just have to uh, remove the plant, sorry to say. Another question on yellow jackets, if the ones in the house roof are the same ones as in the ground. Oh yeah, they nest uh, in many different places. Although wasps also are gonna nest up in the eaves or can get in the attic. So proper identification is key. And then you can also hire a pest control. Like I mentioned before, like Western that has a green service or eco service. Um, there's other um, pest control companies in your area. Um, you just want to ask for the green service um, because it'll be safer, especially inside the house. You don't want to breathe uh, synthetic pesticides. Um, and if you've got pets or children, you don't want to expose them to that either. So always go for the green service or the eco-friendly service, and they'll come and remove those uh, nests inside the house, in the attic, and so forth. They're the only people hiring a uh, pest control company is going to be the only way to remove a nest uh, on a structure or in the house uh, because a vector control will not. We got a question from Bill on spider mites. The webs form on coyote bush in California. Pucas. There's a large Peruvian pepper tree and all its pollen drops and catches in the webs. This combination causes the plant to die underneath. Any good way to prevent the spider mites? Spider mites on the coyote bush? That means that plant is probably getting too much water. Uh, although spider mites are indicator of dry conditions, but coyote bush is such a tough plant. And if it has spider mites, it's stressed out. So it's either, it's maybe in a garden that is too, uh, like maybe the soil is too rich. The environment is too lush. Um, that's something to look at. Um, and then spider mites, you really want to avoid using pesticides on them, such as um, like any of this, the traditional sprays, any of the pyrethroids, things like that. They're very clever at tucking into little nooks and crannies. And when pesticides are sprayed on them, again, a lot of times those pesticides are contact kills. And only a few of them will get killed and the rest of them will disperse to get out of the way of the pesticide. And then you've just increased the population of the spider mites. Um, so if you're going to use a pesticide, it's important to use like insecticidal soap or horticultural oils, reapply. But, you know, oils can be really challenging because when we have heat, the oils then can burn the plants. So really we wanna look at the cultural controls. Why are spider mites getting on your coyote bush? There's something going on in your environment of your garden that is uh, stressing that plant out. He just did a follow up with the soil is not rich and not watered much. And it's also very bad on rosemary. And you're sure it's spider mites because there are other insects that are affecting the rosemary right now. Um, so that makes me curious. Bill, I, I made it allowed to talk if you want to unmute okay. and um, follow up with Susan. You're welcome to. 
I think I'm unmuted. Oh, we know it's spider mites. We brought a yeah. sample of this to uh, Master Gardeners and uh, saw it on one of their plants in a okay. Master Gardener demo garden. They said, yes, spider mites. The area is dry. This is in Livermore and uh, neck near the street, mostly. So might just be a lot of uh, well, blowers, spider mites. Blowers. Okay. Spider mites do thrive in dry conditions. So uh, maybe opening up the canopy of the plant so there's more air circulation, maybe hosing it off just so it can get, you know, some hydration. Um, it's just, that seems a little unusual to me. Um, that's the only reason why I'm questioning it. But um, those are some cultural controls right there that you can start with tomorrow. Opening it up, get more airflow. Um, also more exposure to um, some predators that might come in and feed off of them. Um, I probably wouldn't, I would avoid using any oils on the rosemary um, and I would avoid using um, any oils on the coyote bush, uh, but maybe if they're not getting enough water at all. So maybe that's the other side of this uh, scale too, is that the plants are stressed because they're not getting enough water. So both plants should get watered at least um, a nice deep watering once a month. Um, and I know out in Livermore, you've had some, uh, you've had some triple digits. Um, I'm not sure. Is, I mean, has it been cooler or not as many triple days of triple digits as normal, or has it been just as hot as it always is? This year seems to have been a little, haven't had as many triple digits days, I don't believe. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Uh, we've been very lucky. Um, anyway, but if you uh, if it's just on a regular drip with the rest of your system, I would encourage you maybe just to go ahead um, and maybe even remove the drip or turn the drip off of those plants and then just we hand, hand water. water them. We do okay, hand good. water. And how often do you hand water? About every three weeks to those plants. And how deep is the water infiltrating? Uh, we, we water it for a while, so I, I think it's going down. I, I, I never haven't measured it recently, but it's going down many, uh, you know, probably about a foot. I would just double check because I myself, who feel like I really know what I'm talking about, and I know I, I think I know what I'm doing when I'm watering. I am so surprised. I'm out there watering, watering, watering. I'm getting a suntan. I'm getting sunburned. I'm out there so long. I turn off the water. I go and check. It's literally two inches. So um, I would just invite you just to do a little investigation work to make sure 100% that water is getting deep enough. Well, we've even because seen every three weeks plants in pots, which are getting watered all the time. It just seems like there's loads of spider mites there causing their little webs. Yeah, because there is an infestation. Um, maybe there is an outbreak. Um, you know, you may maybe you tried a pesticide or not, and if you did, no, maybe won't. that's what. We don't okay, pesticides. good. So uh, I would just you know you can open up the get more increase the airflow, blast them off, and just really watch your watering. Um, I'm assuming you. I'm making an assumption that you don't use synthetic fertilizers. Um, so no hopefully that's, yeah, good. So um, that would be where I would start. You can also, you do a little bit of uh, reading on the UCIPM website just to see if there's anything, excuse me, that uh, myself or the master gardeners you spoke with missed. But that's usually, and again, it's kind of hard sometimes having these conversations over a screen. Um, if I was at your garden, you know, for instance, I could, it would be a little bit more intuitive. I could kind of see what was going on. So don't give up on the investigation and uh, ask your neighbor. I mean, maybe you have like your little region of Livermore is having a significant spider mite year, which happens. And especially since you're in hot, dry climate, um, but if you haven't had significant spider mite populations in the past, it might just be. We've uh, had them in the something. past. Yeah. So. Every year. It seems like okay. every year. 
They're kind of I a mean, problem. It's next to the street, and all the everybody else has a blower person. So dry and you know blowing. Maybe that's just we may just be sitting someplace where we're going to get them. Yeah, that sounds like it. The blowers are the worst. I'm so sorry. Oh, you know, might really help you out. Uh, try working in a little uh, earthworm castings to the soil. You don't need a lot, just a couple tablespoons uh, around the root zone uh, under some mulch. Like if you can get it in the soil under the mulch, especially after you've watered. Uh, earthworm castings have uh, amazing enzymes in it that really uh, help to work through the vascular system and the cells and will help reduce it should reduce the spider mite population or do a foliar spray of um, earthworm casting liquid or um, like a sea kelp, liquid seaweed. Those two could be really nice. Or even compost tea if you have access to that. Those are usually products you can't really get though, but um, those would also be really helpful because you're Thank building the cell, cell structure. You're making the plant more resilient. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Thank you to everyone who's who stayed on over time. Um, mildew on brassicas. Um, they've got some on kale and broccolini, powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. So powdery mildew also really likes the dry summer months. Not uncommon to see it right now. But mildew, powdery mildew, is the one fungal disease that can get washed off with water. Totally counterintuitive, right? Where we think of all those fungal diseases and moisture and stuff like that. So you could just get out there, wash off, with, wash it off with water, um, break those uh, spores because what happens is the spores blow in the wind and they get on the other plants. But again, it's very host specific. This, the variety that you have is liking all of your brassicas. Okay, I think this is probably our last question. Um, they'd like to get rid of Bermuda grass. Would sheet mulching work or is there something other non-toxic that you suggest? And is there a certain type of time of year which is best to do this? Oh man, um, I haven't had to talk about Bermuda grass for a long time. So I'm a little rusty on giving you, uh, feeling really confident with what I have to say. I'd have to look that up. So because I would have to look it up, I would encourage you to look it up. And um, stopwaste.org in Alameda County has information on sheet mulching. Well, and um, Linda, what about the um, re lawn replacement program that you have? Uh, would there be any resources there that would also discuss or address Bermuda grass? Because I believe you can use sheet mulching for Bermuda grass. And if you're trying to re remove it and replace it with something else, I would definitely take advantage of the rebates. But you have to do all that paperwork before you start to remove the turf areas. Yeah, I suggest going to South Bay Green Gardens or, or Valley Waters webpage. I don't know if I've seen something specifically on Bermuda grass, but that's kind of where where information would would be. And as far as timing, after if that's if you know you want to take advantage of the rebate if if that's your intention, um, if you want to replace it with uh, desirable plants. But um, as far as timing goes, beyond that, you want to go to the university UCIPM website because it'll talk about um, uh, the timing and when it grows and when you would want to take action. So that's that's going to be really helpful. And then we have another question from Hans: If there's any plants that are not native but um are good for the the climate here with our with our changing climate i'm sorry one more time 
I think he's looking for um, additional plants that are create diversity. Oh, let me just unmute him. Uh, Hans, you can talk. Hi, how are you doing? You should be able to click unmute now. Yeah, I didn't unmute. I just talked. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I just moved uh, two weeks ago here from Germany, and I don't have a garden yet. But I want to make a nice mix sort of some plants to make shadow. And I don't know what to use. If I should get just a cactus or as me. Oh no, you no? don't need to just do cactus. Um, but you can. Oh gosh. So no, but I mean there's... to mix it up for, for the shadow, for, for like the smaller plants. My parents have a nice garden, but I'm from Munich, so there it's quite easy. You get rain <laughs> every couple of weeks, and you right. just put in the shadow what's small and what not, and then you just let it, also, not just let it go, but yeah. It's, it's right. nice. Yeah. Well, it's very easy to garden here, too. It's just a little different. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to choose uh, plants that are like native to the area or that are going to thrive in a summer dry climate. And there are many. Um, there are some really great books you could get at the library. I would actually just start with like a Sunset Western Garden book because it's very basic and you can start from there. Uh, you from the Sunset Western Garden book, you can expand to looking at the uh, California Native Plant Society website. You can kind of do cross-referencing. You can also look at different plant lists on the local Master Gardeners website. But starting with the um, Sunset Western Garden book will be excellent because it's really going to talk about our climate, our microclimates, what that means. It will address mm -hmm. some gardening terms, some pest problems, but then there's a whole encyclopedia of, um, of plants. And I would say that your local library should have a couple publications. Um, I don't know if it's still in print, but um, it's still out there and very popular. So that's why I think the library is a good place to check out. Yeah, I'm going to find it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome and good luck and welcome. Yes, thank you, Sydney. That's well, it. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Suzanne, for staying on over time. Thank you to everyone who's stayed for all the questions. Hope to see you at our upcoming classes. We'll be sending a follow-up email with a survey where you can give us some feedback and um, what topics you'd like to see for future classes. We'll also include some of the links that were presented here and a link to the recording that will be available on the Bosco website. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Yeah, thanks so much. I can't believe everyone's still hanging around. So that's wonderful. <laughs> really great to have everyone tonight. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Linda, have a great evening. Thanks, Christopher. I appreciate uh, all of your assistance tonight. See you next time. Thanks, everyone.